The Einstein field equations are a set of 10 independent, highly coupled, nonlinear, hyperbolic, elliptic, second order partial differential equations that fit into one 4D symmetric tensor field equation. The Einstein field equations relate the metric tensor to the stress energy momentum tensor through curvature tensors that are ultimately derived from the Riemann curvature tensor. This is the mathematical implementation of the statement that matter and energy curve space time to yield gravitational effects. Now anyone who is not hopelessly out of touch with pop culture will know that the Einstein field equations are the Ricci curvature tensor minus a half the scalar curvature times the metric plus the cosmological constant times the metric set equal to 8 pi g over c to the fourth times the stress energy momentum tensor where the scalar curvature is given by the fully contracted Ricci curvature tensor. The Ricci curvature tensor is given in terms of the Christoffel symbols by this formula. The Christoffel symbols are given in terms of the metric by this formula, and the stress energy momentum tensor is given by this formula, which is just the Hilbert stress energy tensor. So a rather horrendous fact has come to my attention. It appears that there are no videos on YouTube that show viewers how to solve the Einstein field equations for even the Schwarzschild metric, the simplest non-trivial solution. I was horrified when I noticed this, as I imagine you can understand, and I felt an immediate need to fix the problem. Thankfully, I've got the skills to save the day, so don't worry. In this video, I will solve the Einstein field equations for the metric and explain the process as I go. The Schwarzschild metric is the simplest non-trivial solution to the Einstein field equations, as I said and it was the first non-trivial solution to be found. It, by extension, is the simplest black hole solution and the simplest Ernst vacuum. It describes a vacuum containing only one thing, and that is a special type of black hole called a Schwarzschild black hole. The vacuum is defined by the following key properties. No vacuum energy. It's a completely empty space, except for one singular chargeless mass. It's spherically symmetric and static, and it's Lorentzian. These key properties are written here, and they will be referred to as the uh, Schwarzschild assumptions. The first two properties give the following two things, that the cosmological constant is zero, obviously, and then uh, the stress-energy-momentum tensor goes to zero due to this one, because of the limit that all of the contents of the vacuum go to one singular point. In that limit, the stress-energy-momentum tensor goes to zero. For this problem, spherical coordinates will be used. The next thing to do is look for or look at the Minkowski metric and spherical coordinates, which is Lorentzian, and deduce the most general possible alterations that we can make to it without violating conditions three and four. The Minkowski metric and spherical coordinates is this, right? Now, the reason why we want to do this exercise that I just described is because it'll give us the ansatz for the uh, Schwarzschild metric. So the first thing that must be noted is that the Minkowski metric is, uh, has the correct Lorentzian metric signature already. So the most general alterations allowed by both conditions 3 and 4 cannot include changing the sign of the diagonal components. The second thing to note is the following. In spherical coordinates, non-zero off-diagonal components in the metric break the spherically, spher spherical symmetry of the manifold and therefore must be excluded given condition 3. Therefore, the most general alteration allowed by both conditions 3 and 4 must leave off-diagonal component 0. The third thing that must be noted is that altering the pure theta and pure phi components in any way also breaks the spherical symmetry of the manifold. Therefore, the most general allowed alteration must include or must not include changing these components because of condition 3. This leaves only two components, the pure time and the pure radial component. It is possible to alter these components without violating conditions three or four, but they cannot be altered arbitrarily. The most general allowed alteration must not change the sign of the components to avoid violating condition four, and it must not depend on the time or angular coordinates to avoid violating condition three. Therefore, the most general metric that uh, satisfies all the Schwarzschild assumptions simultaneously is this here, where the only alterations are two purely radially dependent functions in the purely radial component and the purely time component. This is called the Schwarzschild ansatz. Using the Schwarzschild ansatz, uh, assumptions and deductions, we have been able to figure out most of the metric. Only two single variable metric functions remain to be uh, computed. 
To find these still unknown metric functions, one must solve the Einstein field equations for this ansatz. To do this, we must plug in this ansatz into the Einstein field equations. When this is done, the EFE collapsed down to a set of equations satisfied by the unknown metric functions. The unknown metric functions can then be found up to an unknown constant by solving these equations. The unknown constant can be determined by taking the non-relativistic limit of the geodesic equation and demanding that it be consistent with Newton's law of gravitation. The unknown constant ends up being the Schwarzschild radius. Now to carry out this procedure. First, simplifying the EFE with the following assumptions that we got to above, specifically these assumptions. If we plug them in, we get this. So now if we add this to the other side and take the trace of both sides, we ultimately arrive at r, the scalar curvature, equals twice the scalar curvature, which gives us r equals zero. If we plug that back into here, then we get that the Ricci curvature tensor equals zero too. So our geometry is Ricci flat. These are the vacuum field equations. So what we have is that we're solving the uh, vacuum field equations uh, to find the unknown metric functions. Uh, <clears throat> specifically, we must insert the ansatz, the Schwarzschild ansatz, into this equation, uh, and it will give differential equations satisfied by the unknown metric functions. The first step in this process is to calculate uh, the Christoffel symbols for the Schwarzschild ansatz. There are 13 non-zero Christoffel symbols for the Schwarzschild ansatz. All the rest of the 64 are zero. I will only show the calculation of the 13 non-zero ones because the others trivially evaluate to zero. If you want to spend your time calculating the other ones, calculating however many zeros you need to to get all of them, then you can do that on your own time. So <clears throat> the first non-zero one, the first non-zero Christoffel symbol is gamma 313. But because of the fact that the Christoffel symbols are symmetric under the interchange of the lower two indices, these two just intervert, and then that one doesn't change at all, then that's actually also equal to gamma 331. So we can calculate two at once, two of the 13 at once. So gamma 313 equals gamma 331. So expanding out the sum over the contracted indices, and ignoring zero terms resulting from zero metric components, we get that this equals one over two G super three, three B one G subscript three, three, where this is the contravariant metric. And since the metric we're dealing with is diagonal, uh, it's nearly the same. The contravariant metric is, it's nearly the same as the covariant metric, except that we take one over the diagonal components. And that's just because it's a diagonal matrix. That's not obviously generally the case. So then if we plug in the non-zero, the values for the non-zero metric components, then we get 1 over 2 uh, times 1 over negative r squared sine squared theta dr minus r squared sine squared theta. And then if we take this derivative and simplify, we get that this equals just 1 over r. So I'm going to make a list of these as we compute them. So uh, I'm going to make a list down here. Our first result is gamma 1, 3, 1 equals gamma 3, 3, 1 equals 1 over r. Okay, so that's the first two, so that means we've got 11 more to do. Uh, and the next one, we also get a two-for-one deal. The next non-zero ones that we're going to compute is gamma 212, but of course, for the same reason, that's equal to gamma 221. So we have another uh, two birds with one stone. 212 equals gamma 221. Now, uh, again, expanding out the sum over the contracted indices and ignoring uh, zero terms resulting from the zero metric components, we get uh, 1 over 2 g 2 2 d 1 g 2 2. Right, so then inserting uh, these non-zero non components of the metric, 
then this gives us 1 over 2, 1 over minus r squared, the 1 of minus r squared. Okay, so if we take the derivative, then we get uh, 1 over r again. So then we can add that to our list here just by writing this, gamma 2, 1, 2, gamma 2, 2, 1. Okay, right, so now we've calculated 4. We've got 9 of the 13 left go. So the next one is sadly not a two for one deal because the two lower indices are the same thing. And it is gamma two, three, three. And then that again, uh, expanding out the sum over contracted indices. And by the way, I'm using this formula right here to compute it. I'm using this, uh, metric tensor, so the Schwarzschild ansatz, and I'm basically just plugging it into that formula and computing all the non-zero index combinations. Right, so ignoring zero terms resulting from zero metric components, then this uh, ends up being minus one over two g two two d two g three three. Right, okay, so now plugging in uh, the values for the non-zero metric components, this becomes minus 1 over 2 uh, times 1 over minus r squared times d2 of minus r squared sine squared theta, right? And then taking the derivative uh, and simplifying, this ends up becoming minus sine theta, cosine theta. Okay, so then we'll add that to our list. We now have five of them, two, three, three, gamma, two, three, three. Let's see, equals minus sine theta, cosine theta. So that's the first five. Now, the next one that we're going to compute again is a two for one deal because the lower indices aren't identical. And therefore, we can... Uh, flip them, and by the symmetry of the Christoffel symbols, it will be equal. So we can get again 2 and bump our total up to 7. So the next one we're going to calculate is gamma 3, 2, 3. And then this is, of course, equal for the same reason, gamma 3, 3, 2. So then uh, expanding out the sum over contracted indices again and ignoring uh, zero terms resulting from zero components of the metric gives us for this these Christoffel symbols, 1 over 2, G, 3, 3, D, 2, G, 3, 3. Okay, so now plugging in the values for the non-zero metric components, this gives us 1 over 2 minus R squared sine squared sine squared theta. Okay, so 1 over that times d2 uh, of minus r squared sine squared theta. Okay, so then doing the derivative and simplifying, this gives us cotangent theta. Okay, so then we can add that to our list, both of these. Uh, so now we have a total of 7, gamma 3, 2, 3, equals gamma 3, 3, 2, equals cotangent theta. So I'll move out of the way for a moment so you can see. So these are the seven we've calculated so far. That's the list. And then that's the calculation of the one we just did. So now erasing this, we can calculate the next one. The next one's not a two for one deal again because sadly the lower indices are the same. There's no particular meaning to the order in which I'm calculating these, by the way. The next one, the next non-zero one we're going to compute is gamma 1, 1, 1. Then uh, ignoring, again, non-zero terms due to non-zero metric functions and uh, simplifying it down in terms of just the uh, non-zero ones, we get that this equals 1 over 2 g 1 1 d 1 g 1 1 where again this is the metric we're using the Schwarzschild assumption 
right? So then inserting the uh, value of the non-zero components, this ends up equaling one over two, one over minus a d one uh, of minus a. So then writing the derivative as a prime, we get that this is a prime over 2a. This is the first Christoffel symbol we've calculated that actually involved some of the unknown metric functions. Okay, so we will add that one to the list. Gamma 1, 1, 1 equals a prime over 2a. Wicked. So then that's like the eighth one or something. I think that's the eighth one. Uh, so then the next one again is a two for one deal because the lower indices aren't the same. So we get two that are equal. So the next ones we're going to calculate are gamma zero one zero equals gamma zero zero one. Right. So then ignoring uh, expanding out the sum uh, over contracted indices and ignoring zero terms resulting from zero metric components gives that this equals one over two. Uh, g zero zero d one g zero zero. Okay. So then, uh, plugging in the the values of the non-zero metric components, we get that this equals one over two, one over minus a. Nope. Nope. Shoot. I'm plugging in the wrong components. Oh well. Easy fix. This is a dry erase board. Okay, so then in reality, it's 1 over b c squared, dr b c squared. And then this ends up, uh, when we write the derivative as uh, b prime and simplify a little, this is b prime over 2b. Okay, we can add that to our list now. Gamma, I, let's add it down here. I don't know if the room where it's going to write it. Gamma zero one zero equals gamma zero zero one equals b prime over two b. Okay, so that's like like ten or something. I don't I don't know how far we are in the list of thirteen. We've calculated most of them by now. Okay, so the next one again, lower indices are the same, so we only get. 1 for our efforts instead of 2, then 1, 2, 2. Then, as before, uh, the process proceeds the same. It equals 1 over 2g, 1, 1, d, 1, g, 2, 2, which is just plugging that into there and ignoring zero terms. Now plugging in the value for the non-zero metric components, uh, this gives us a minus 1 over 2, 1 over minus a, d, r, of minus r squared. So then this is equal to r over minus a. Okay, we'll add that to our list right here. Gamma 1, 2, 2 equals r over minus a. So then this is the list so far. I'll step out of the way so you can see it. This is the list of all the Christoffel symbols calculated so far. We're almost done. Uh, erasing this. Then we have a few more to calculate. Let's see. Now only two more to calculate. Cool. So the next one uh, is gamma 1, 0, 0 equals, right, again, so uh, plugging in the values, uh, uh, wait, no, expanding out the sum over contracted indices and ignoring zero terms resulting from zero metric components gives us the result 1 over 2 g 1 1 d 1 g 0 0 for this Christoffel symbol. Now plugging in uh, the values for the non-zero metric components gives us that this equals minus 1 over 2 1 over minus a d r c uh, let's see d r of c squared b okay so then writing the derivative is b prime this ends up being c squared b prime over 2a that's the second to last one it's the 12th one i'll i'll add that to the list right here zero zero equals c squared b prime over 2a
So this is our list of Christoffel symbols so far, made out of the way so you can see it. And then we've got one remaining Christoffel symbol to calculate. There's just one left. And that last non-zero one is gamma 133. Three. Gamma 133. Three. So uh, expanding out the sum over contracted indices and sums over contracted indices and ignoring the zero terms resulting from zero metric components then gives us that this equals minus 1 over 2 g11 d1 g33 three, three. Uh, now plugging in the values for the non-zero metric components gives us that this equals minus 1 over 2 1 over minus a dr of minus r squared sine squared theta so then taking the derivative and simplifying a little bit gives us r sine squared theta over a. So then let's add that to our list right here. Gamma 1, 3, 3 equals minus r sine squared theta over a. Cool. So that is the complete set of 13 non-zero Christoffel symbols for the Schwarzschild Ansatz. All the rest are zero. There's a total of 64 of them, and our problem simplified massively by all these zeros, and the fact that the metric functions don't all depend on all of the variables. There's a lot of ones that are proportional to derivatives, partial derivatives that are zero. Right? Ultimately, just kills a whole bunch of those Christoffel symbols. It zeroes them out and leaves us with only 13 non-zero ones. So where have we gotten so far? We started by looking at the formulas for the different terms in the Einstein field equations. We wrote out and considered the Schwarzschild assumptions, got the Schwarzschild ansatz and these two facts from that, and now we've just started plugging that into the Einstein field equations. The first two things when we plug it in gave us that the Schwarzschild metric solves the vacuum field equations, and now we're just in the process of plugging um, the uh, Schwarzschild uh, ansatz into that. And then the next step, because we're solving these equations, which says that the, the Ricci curvature tensor equals zero, is to calculate the Ricci curvature tensor from these components, uh, from these uh, Christoffel symbols. And we can see the Ricci curvature tensor is given by this formula in terms of the Christoffel symbols. So the fact we've just calculated all of them is exactly what we needed to do. It puts us in the place where we need to go. So there are... Uh, only four non-zero uh, components to this. Now, technically, we're going to set all of them equal to zero, but it turns out there are two types still. Ones that automatically evaluate to zero regardless of what you're setting them equal to, so they're identically equal to zero. And then there are components of that tensor that aren't identically equal to zero, and we have to set them equal to zero, and that will give us the differential equations we'll be solving. Uh, and there are only four that aren't automatically equal to zero. And I'm only going to calculate those. If you want to calculate the ones that automatically evaluate to zero, then that's just fine. So the first one that uh, you, you can do that on your own time. The first one that is non-zero uh, is R00. Zero, zero. So the pure time component of this, right? And since there are 16 components total and it's a symmetric tensor, there are 10 independent components. And since only, or since, uh, since uh, all but four just automatically evaluate to zero, We've only got, uh, the, the, that means actually six of the independent components are automatically zero, just given the nature of this assumption. But anyway, uh, so expanding out the, uh, the sums over contracted indices, and you can see there are quite a few of them, right? And ignoring zero terms resulting from zero Christoffel symbols, uh, gives us the following. Well, actually, I'll write out the formula without the, the indices, um, the summed over indices, the, the sums expanded. So let's start with just that, d0 gamma rho, 0 rho minus d rho gamma rho 0 0 plus gamma sigma 
zero rho gamma rho sigma zero minus gamma sigma zero zero gamma rho sigma rho. Okay, so all I've done is taken the fact that we're looking at the zero zero component, so I've set all the live indices to zero. So then you can see uh, these are these indices are contracted, they're summed over. So then, not what I was saying I was going to do before, and what I did just right away for all the Christoffel symbol calculations. And what I'm going to do now is expand the sum over contracted indices and ignore zero terms resulting from zero Christoffel symbols. Now, when we do that, what we get is that this equals minus D1 gamma 1 0 0 plus gamma 0 0 1 gamma 1 0 0. This is a long formula. Minus gamma 1, 0, 0, gamma 1, 1, 1, minus gamma, let's see, 1, 0, 0. Have I gotten off track on my writing? Let's see. Minus D1, gamma, gamma 0, 1, 0, gamma 1, 0, 0, gamma 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay, one zero zero gamma. Okay, no, I wasn't. I was right in the right place. Cool. Minus gamma one zero zero gamma three one three. Okay, so then this thing here is it written out in terms of just the Christoffel symbols that are non-zero? Now I'm running out of space, so I'm going to erase what I've written so far, and then I'm going to plug in the values for the non-zero Christoffel symbols into that and we'll get uh, an expression for the Ricci curvature directly in terms of sine thetas and r's and the unknown metric function, in terms of the things that show up in the Schwarzschild ansatz. So let me erase this and do that. Okay, so uh, plugging in the values of the non-zero Christoffel symbols gives us this expression. Let's see, minus dr c squared b prime over 2a plus b prime over 2b c squared b prime over 2a. Okay, minus c squared b prime a prime over 2a, 2a, minus c squared b prime over 2a, 1 over r, a minus c squared b prime over 2a times 1 over r. And what you're realizing now is actually doing calculations in general relativity is extremely arduous. It's uh, not for the people who like quick math. So then if we do the derivatives, so we actually evaluate that derivative right there, and we simplify and rearrange into the nicest, uh, simplest form, we get the following result for this component. We get that uh, r0,0 zero, zero equals c squared times minus b prime prime over 2a, so that's the second derivative with respect, of b with respect to r, so b prime over 4a times a prime over a plus b prime over b minus b prime over r a. So that's that result. Now I'm going to make a list of these results, and I'm running out of space, so I'm actually going to erase that. That's not needed anymore. We already talked about that. That was way at the beginning of the calculation, so I'm going to erase that. I'll erase that too. Okay, and I'll make my list up here. R zero zero equals c squared. There are only four, so this will be enough space to list them all. Minus b prime prime over 
a plus b prime over 4a times a prime over a plus b prime over b minus b prime over r a. Okay, so now the vacuum field equations say that all the components of the Ricci curvature tensor are equal to zero. So then what I'm going to do is uh, actually do this. R zero zero equals zero equals that. So then this is the first differential equation satisfied by the unknown metric functions. It's the first of four, and it's, uh, it's those four that will solve to find out what the metric functions are. Let's erase that and calculate the next non-zero component of the Ricci curvature tensor for the Schwarzschild onset. This is tiring. So performing the same process as before, we get that R11, which is the next non-zero component, equals D1 gamma rho 1 rho minus d rho gamma rho 1 1 plus gamma sigma 1 rho gamma rho uh, sigma 1 minus gamma sigma 1 1 gamma rho sigma rho. Yep, so then expanding out the sum and ignoring and not, or ignoring all the zero terms, right? Okay, this equals D1 gamma 0, 1, 0 plus D1 gamma 2, 1, 2 plus D1 gamma 3, 1, 3 plus gamma 0, 1, 0 gamma 0, 0, 1 minus gamma 1, 1, 1 gamma 0, 1, 0, minus gamma 1, 1, 1, gamma 2, 1, 2, minus gamma 1, 1, 1, gamma 3, 1, 3. Yeah, that's messy. Okay, so just so you can see what's going on. The uh, next component, R11, equals that, expanding out all the uh, sums over contracted indices and uh, forgetting this is a sigma, a really terrible sigma, and forgetting about uh, terms that are zero because the Christoffel symbols, uh, some of the Christoffel symbols in those terms are zero. Right, so then plugging in the, the values for the non-zero Christoffel symbols in here, so all those values we get, uh, let's see, dr b prime over 2b plus dr1 over r, plus dr1 over r, plus b prime over 2b, times b prime over 2b, minus a prime over 2a, times b prime over 2b, minus a prime over 2a, 1 over r minus a prime over 2a. Yeah, both terms are the same. For a second I thought I'd seen wrong. Plus 1 over r squared plus 1 over r squared. So then taking the derivatives and simplifying this down, it's not that many steps. It's absolutely straightforward algebra. Then the final simplified answer is B. But you know what? I'm just going to write it up there right away so that I don't have to write it down twice like I did the last time, which was kind of a waste of time and energy. Right. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay, so then as we just calculated, after simplification, the expression that I just wrote down, the really long one for this component, uh, what, uh, the simplified answer that I uh, just mentioned is b prime prime over 2b. Yep, okay. 
minus b prime over 4b times b prime over b plus a prime over a minus a prime over ra. So that's two of the field equations that we've got. We've got two more Ricci curvature tensor components to calculate here. This is not, again, for those that like quick math. The third Ricci curvature tensor component that is non-zero is R22, and then that one equals B2 gamma rho 2 rho minus B rho gamma rho 2 2. Yeah, okay, so plus gamma sigma two rho gamma rho sigma two and then minus gamma sigma two two gamma rho sigma rho and then this uh, given that uh, g given the how many of these are are zero. This, when you expand out the sums and ignore the zero terms, ends up equaling minus b1 gamma 1 2 2 plus b2 gamma 3 2 3. Let's see, yep, minus gamma 1 2 2 gamma 0 1 0 minus gamma 1 2 2 gamma one 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 minus gamma one two two gamma three one three plus gamma two two one gamma one two two plus gamma three two three gamma three three two okay so plugging in the values for the non-zero Christoffel symbols this, actually, this thing actually doesn't look so bad when you do that. Uh, it's not terribly long. We have that this equals dr r over a plus d theta cotangent theta plus r over a b prime over 2b plus r over a a prime over 2a plus r over a 1 over r minus 1 over r r over a plus cotangent squared theta. Now we can take the derivatives and simplify. I'm going to write the simplified result just straight up in our list there so that I don't have to write it twice like last time. So the simplified result for R22, the third non-zero Ricci curvature tensor component that we've calculated, works out to be minus 1 minus R over 2A a prime over a minus b prime over b plus 1 over a. Okay. So we can erase this mess. And this is just, that thing is just what you get from simplifying. As I said, it's just what you get from simplifying this. And it's a very straightforward, easy simplification to do. It's just like calc one level stuff. Okay, the final, and yes, we're finally nearing completion here. The final non-zero component of the Ricci curvature tensor for the Schwarzschild ensembles is 
R three three. Now that of course, just as before, just like before equals three gamma or d three gamma rho three rho minus d rho gamma rho three three plus gamma sigma three rho gamma rho sigma three. Okay, minus gamma sigma three three gamma rho sigma rho. So then expanding out the sum and ignoring zero terms, this ends up equaling the following mass. Minus d1 gamma 1 3 3 minus d2 gamma 2 3 3 minus gamma 1 3 3 gamma 0 1 0 minus gamma 1 3 3 gamma 0 1 0 minus gamma 1 3 3 gamma 1 1 1 minus gamma 1 3 3 gamma 2 1 2 plus gamma 3 3 1 gamma 1 3 3 plus gamma 3 2 3 2 gamma 2 3 3 so then r 3 3 ultimately ends up equaling this horrible mess in terms of these non-zero Christoffel symbols so Let's plug those values in. I'm going to need to erase this, so if you want to see it, pause and look at it now, because I'm going to erase it to have room uh, to substitute in all of those, uh, all of all of the values of these non-zero Christoffel symbols. So erasing that. Now, when we plug all the values in, and I did some factoring, because it would just be pointlessly too long if I didn't. But aside from the factoring, I've done no simplification. This equals, then, dr, r sine squared theta over a plus d2 sine theta cosine theta minus negative b prime over 2b minus a prime over 2a. Uh, and then these cancel, of course, but I'll write them out anyway and then not simplify more than the factoring I talked about. r sine times r sine squared theta over a. Okay, and then this is minus cotangent theta, sine theta, cosine theta. So let me just sit down here, or sit, uh, look at this for a moment, not sit down. Stand here and look at this for a moment and make sure I got it all right. Looks like I did. Okay, so aside from the factoring that's unsimplified. I'll write the simplified result up here. So once you take the derivatives and simplify and all that stuff, we get r3 3 equals 0 equals this following simplified result. Uh, well, actually, let me just look at this for a moment. Uh, okay, yeah, there we go. Sine squared theta. times minus 1 minus r over 2a, a prime over a, minus b prime over b, plus 1 over a. Now you'll notice something interesting. If we compare r22 and r33, oh, let me erase this so that I don't have an unnecessary mess, and then we'll talk about that. Okay, so if you look at R22 and R33, you see the only difference is this factor of sine squared theta. And it's, both are set equal to zero, so you can divide that up. So these two equations are exactly the same. So then we only have three independent equations, but we've only got two metric functions to solve for, so that's absolutely fine.
Uh, and now for space, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, erase some stuff. Uh, now that we have these, we don't need to see these anymore, the Christoffel symbols. I might want to leave them up there for sort of an overview. In fact, uh, let's do a review of how, how far we've gotten so far. So we started with the Einstein field equations, we looked at the formulas, we wrote out the Schwarzschild assumptions, and we deduced these two facts and the Schwarzschild ansatz from it. And we then uh, figured out that these two, the A and B here, implied that we were solving the vacuum field equations. All right. Okay, so then we plugged in this ansatz that we got, also from those assumptions, into the vacuum field equations. And that gave us these four constraints right here. Through that, we calculated all the Christoffel symbols by plugging this into that formula. We got those, and then we calculated the Ricci curvature tensor by plugging all of those into this formula, which gave us this, because the vacuum field equations say that the Ricci curvature is zero, so it's a Ricci flat geometry. So then the next thing we need to do is the actual solving. This is where we actually solve the Einstein field equation. So far, we've just been setting up the problem and working out what the EFE collapsed down to when we plug in our ansatz. Now we actually have to solve those equations. Yeah, I think actually I'm going to try and do it without erasing anything. I want to leave this stuff up here. So Carl Schwarzschild figured out a trick for solving these equations. And it's not obvious, but you'll see why it's important. And strangely, the trick is to evaluate the following combination, r0,0 0, 0 over b c squared plus r1,1 1, 1 over a. Now this, of course, equals 0 because both numerators equal 0. But what we're going to do is plug in these tensor component values for those and then simplify it down. And what we'll find is we actually get a really, really critical fact about the metric functions. We get a simple relationship between the two, and we, we therefore reduce our problem down to just solving for one. Uh, so then, plugging this in, it's general relativity, it's arduous, deal with it, 1 over b times minus b prime prime over 2a, it's supposed to be an a, right, plus b prime over 4a times a prime over a plus b prime over b. Okay, and then this minus b prime over r a plus 1 over a b prime prime over 2b. I regret writing this out, but I'm going to finish it because I started it. b prime over 4b, b prime over b, minus a prime over a. Okay, and then minus a prime over r a. So now if we simplify this down, it's again really straightforward. It's just pure algebra. It actually simplifies down a lot. This quantity right here, which equals 0 and that, ends up simplifying down to this really, really simple result. v prime over r v a minus a prime over r a squared. So then this equals 0. So we get this relation here, and that relation will give us a super simple result. So what I'm going to do is erase the, this whole thing, and then just rewrite this relation, and we'll manipulate it algebraically to get a final key answer. And uh, from then on, our problem will get drastically easier. So I'm going to rewrite this at the top then. 0 equals minus b prime over r b a minus a prime over r a squared equals 
put zero on the other side of the equation already. No need to do that again. Okay. So now what we can do is we can uh, divide out all the factors that are common between the two terms. This gives us that zero equals a prime over a plus b prime over b. Now the next key here is to integrate this. So if we integrate this equation and we get zero equals a prime over a dr plus b prime over b dr. This gives us ln of a plus ln of b. Right, and then through log properties, this gives us ln of a b. Okay. So then we can take the exponential of both sides, and that gives us e to the 0 equals so 1, which equals a times b, because the log and the exponential cancel. So now I'm going to erase and rewrite this at the top and we'll get the, the key result we were looking for, the key thing we were solving for that I mentioned. Carl Schwarzschild's idea that ultimately allowed the solution to be computed. Right, so then this, I'll rewrite it up here, 1 equals a b. But then of course this tells us that a equals 1 over b. So now we have this really important fact. These two unknown metric functions are actually related. They're inverses of each other. The Einstein field equations have told us that. So now we only need to solve for one, and we'll immediately have the other given to us via this relation. This relation is really important, so I'm going to write it up here, and I'm going to leave it in a box. It's 1 over b. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do, since we've already used those two equations, I'm going to now plug this relation, this value for a, into the third equation. So this one right here. And that will give us the equation we're actually going to be solving. So then uh, using this equation and that relation, we have 0 equals minus 1 uh, minus r b over 2 minus b b prime over b squared minus b prime over b plus b and this equals minus 1 plus r b prime plus b so then the equation we actually have to solve what Einstein's field equations have finally all reduced down to all of this has given us one simple equation that we have to solve. And that equation from here you can see is just 0 equals minus 1 plus r b prime plus b. Now you'll, the, the interesting thing here is that after all that insane mess, all the nonlinearity we had to deal with in, in the, the Christoffel symbols and the Ricci curvature tensor, the Einstein field equations are crazy nonlinear. All of that goes away, and we get this simple equation that we have to solve. So uh, I'm going to erase the unnecessary math, rewrite this key relation at the top, and then review the process up until this point. 0 equals minus 1 plus uh, R B prime plus B. Okay. So to recap, so far we wrote out the Einstein field equations and all the formulas for the uh, symbols inside it. Then we wrote out the Schwarzschild assumptions and deduced these two quantities, got the vacuum field equations, and then we also used it to, do, uh, to deduce the Schwarzschild ansatz, which is this thing right here. Then we uh, wrote out the uh, vacuum 
Einstein field equations for this ansatz by plugging this metric ansatz into this formula for the Christoffel symbols and then plugging, and, and that's what these are, and then plugging all those into this formula for the Ricci curvature tensor and setting it equal to zero because we're solving the vacuum Einstein field equations. Uh, and that gave us these. And then we did some adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing and stuff uh, with these to ultimately reveal this fact. We did some algebra with them to reveal that A equals 1 over B according to the Einstein field equations for this ansatz. So then we plug this into the third equation, so R22 equals 0, and that gave us this equation. Now, just by inspection, it's such a ridiculously simple equation. This is solved by B equals 1 minus 2s over r, where s is just some arbitrary constant. So now what I'm going to do, and, and then we have, of course, that a equals 1 over that because of that. So we have now 1 minus 2s over r. So now you can see that the Schwarzschild metric is almost here. We've almost got it. We just need to determine what this s is. And that is the next order of business. So what I'm going to do now is uh, write out the Schwarzschild ansatz. I'm going to rewrite it, except now I'm going to insert these values. So we have an updated metric. We have as much as we know about the metric at this point written out, which is everything except for one undetermined parameter. So then... Uh, I'm just going to erase this now. We won't be needing it anymore. And the metric up until this point with that inserted is g mu mu equals uh, and I need more room in my brackets than that. That's probably big enough. Let's see, 1 minus 2s over r, c squared. And we have minus 1 over 1 minus 2s over r, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. OK. Then we have minus r squared. 0, 0, 0, and then we have minus r squared sine squared theta, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so this is what we know about the metric so far. We've got the functional form determined, and you'll recognize that uh, from the Schwarzschild metric. We just need to determine what that is. Now, the last job then is to find out what the value of that uh, constant actually is. To find this constant we will use the geodesic equation uh, and we will mandate that it uh, uh, the, the non-relativistic limit of it uh, is consistent with Newton's law. So uh, <clears throat> one uses the fact that the geodesic equation must agree with Newton's law of gravitation and the limit that the speed of light goes to infinity for the case of specifically the co-moving frame, because that's when Newton's laws are valid. So the geodesic equation is, uh, you, you should know this by now. I mean, if you don't, then that's, that's kind of unfortunate. d squared x beta over d tau squared equals minus gamma beta rho nu dx rho d tau d x nu d tau. So then the statement that the, uh, in, the in the limit as, as c goes to infinity, this should give us the non-relativistic radial acceleration, so the, the radial component. So then we should have that a r equals the limit as c goes to infinity d squared x1 over d tau squared. But then by the geodesic equation, this then equals negative the limit 
as c goes to infinity gamma 1 rho nu d x rho over d tau d x nu over d tau okay and then this side is actually easier to compute so let's compute it So I'm going to rewrite that for the quantity we are going to compute. So that I've got room to do the math. I'll write it up here. A R equals the limit as C goes to infinity of minus gamma one rho nu d x rho over d tau dx nu over d tau okay so that's what we're going to compute now clearly what we need to do is calculate the proper velocity for this metric here the Schwarzschild metric with the constant still unknown and then we can plug that in and the Christoffel symbols and what we'll find is that we'll need to evaluate uh, some Christoffel symbols uh, that are written in terms of the unknown metric functions for the metric functions whose form we now know. But we'll get to that in a minute. So to calculate the proper velocity, we can start with the line element of the metric, so uh, if of that metric. So c squared d tau squared equals 1 minus 2s over r c squared d t squared minus 1 over 1 minus 2 s over r dr squared minus r squared d theta squared minus r squared sine squared theta d phi squared. So that's the line element. Now the first step we're going to do, the, the, pro, the approach we're going to take to calculating the proper velocity is like this. We'll calculate the time component, and then we'll get an expression for the space components in terms of the ordinary velocity, just dxi over dt times uh, the time component. right? And then uh, because we just calculated the time component, we'll have an expression for all of them. Then, since we're looking at this in the co-moving frame, we'll set the ordinary velocity, so dxi over dt equals zero, and that'll give us a, a simple four vector for the proper velocity in the co-moving frame. And then that's what we'll plug into this quantity right here. Now, the first step in calculating the uh, time component of the proper velocity, which is uh, uh, dt over d tau, or really dx naught over d tau, is uh, going to be uh, to divide both sides by dt squared and uh, with res or by c squared. Okay, so when we do that, okay, I need more room. What can I erase? What can I erase without a problem? You know, I think I'm going to erase the Christoffel symbols. I don't want to, but I'm running out of space. I'm going to have to erase them. So they've been up there for a while, so it's not like you haven't had time to look at them. Okay. So then when we do that, we get that d tau squared over or d tau over dt all squared equals 1 minus 2 s over r that might be too small for you to see 2 s over r minus 1 over c squared 1 minus 2 s over r and then dr over dt squared minus r squared c squared d theta 
over dp squared minus r squared sine squared theta over c squared d theta or d phi over dp quantity squared. Okay, so then the zero component of, this is the square of the zero component. Well, it's actually the square of one over the zero component. So therefore we can take the square root and we can take one over that to get the zero component of the proper velocity. And that just is u zero, where u is gonna be the proper velocity. It's the letter we're gonna use for it. Okay, equals dt over d tau, and this equals, uh, equals, not times, this equals 1 minus 2s over r, uh, minus 1 over c squared, 1 minus 2s over r, And dr over dt quantity squared minus r squared over c squared d theta over dt squared minus r squared sine squared theta over c squared d phi over dt squared, all to the minus 1 over 2. Okay, so then that is the uh, time component of the proper velocity. Thankfully, we don't have to deal with this massive expression there. And I apologize about my messy handwriting. But anyway, when we, we're, we're looking specifically at the co-moving frame. So when we zero all the normal velocity components, so the radial velocity, the polar angle, angular velocity, and the uh, azimuthal angular velocity, th those terms, all except for that one, goes to zero. So then we end up with, in the co-moving frame, now I can erase all this mess and just write that out. We have in the co-moving frame, so uh, in the co-moving frame, this equals u0, the time component equals 1 minus 2s over r to the minus 1 over 2. So now we need to calculate the spatial components. Now, that's actually pretty easy to do. We have that ui, where i just runs from 1 to 3 over the spatial components, equals dxi over d tau. Then this equals dx, we can use the chain rule, dxi over dt, dt over d tau. But then dt over d tau just equals u naught, and this just equals vi, the normal spatial velocity, u naught. I can draw a better u than that. There we go. Okay, so we've got vi times u naught. But in the co-moving frame, we're setting this equal to zero. So then that whole thing is zero. So we just have, uh, in the co-moving frame, I'll erase this and just write it. We have just ui equals zero. So then the full four momentum vector u rho equals dx rho over d tau. Then this equals the full four vector is one minus two s over r well, no, to the minus one half. 0, 0, 0. So this is the full 4 vector. So now we can plug that into this quantity here, 
and actually compute what this radial acceleration is. And then we'll look at Newton's gravity law and get a formula for this non-relativistic radial acceleration. And we'll demand that it equals this limit. And what that will do is it will fix this constant s that's still the only last thing we have left to determine. OK, so let me clear the space and do that. So let me plug that formula for the, uh, the proper velocity here in, uh, and we ignore all zero terms, then we have that this limit equals the limit as c goes to infinity. This equals gamma, or uh, uh, the limit of zero, 1 gamma 1 0 0 u 0 u 0. Okay, so the reason why we only have this one term is because in the co-moving frame, as you remember, all the spatial velocities zeroed out. So we only have one term to compute. So plugging all of the values in here, uh, then we get the following result. Uh, let's see, and including including the metric functions, we're going to plug them into this Christoffel symbol and calculate it. I erased what it was in terms of metric functions to clear space, but you can look back in the video and get it. Ultimately, this can be written as uh, c is limit as c goes to infinity of the following, c squared 1 minus to s over r prime c over 2 times 1 minus 2s over r. Right now we can plug in the value for the, the co-moving the, the co frame value for the zero components of the proper velocities. And then that multiplies this in the brackets by there's, uh, this one is a, a quantity to the minus one half, and this is the same quantity to the minus one half, so we get a, an overall quantity just to the minus one. So we have uh, one minus two s over r to the minus one. And that bracket shouldn't be there, it should be here. Okay, but then these two things cancel. So then what we have uh, at the end of the day is equal 1 over 2 limit c goes to infinity of c squared d over dr of 1 minus 2s over r. So that's what we've gotten. This A of R here, the non-relativistic radial acceleration, equals the simple limit of that quantity. So then, uh, simplifying this down completely, getting the absolute final answer for the, the value of this limit before we figure out what S is, we have 1 over 2 limit as C goes to infinity. C square of C squared 2s over R squared. That is a terrible R. There is a better R. So this is the key result we wanted here. So we've calculated this limit there. Well, we've calculated it for arbitrary s. So we can't actually take the limit yet because we, we haven't figured out what s is yet. So what I'm going to do is then erase all this intermediate calculation we did and just write this up at the top there. And then we'll work out what Newton's law says this a r should be, this uh, non-relativistic radial acceleration. And then we'll mandate that they match. Uh, and when we mandate that they match, that will fix s. So let me erase and rewrite that at the top. And then we'll talk Newton's laws in the co-moving frame. Okay. 
then our key result of the last bit of calculation equals AR equals one half lim C goes to infinity C squared 2x over R. Okay, so now Newton's law of gravitation, we'll write that out. We have that for the, the radial acceleration here. So we have that M, let's see, well, F R, so it's the radial force here, okay, equals M A R, where A R is the non relativistic radial acceleration, so it's that. So we've got an expression from general relativity for what that should be, and we're going to make it agree with Newton's laws in the limit that C goes to infinity, so it's a non relativistic limit. Um, we're going to make it agree with Newton's gravity law by fixing S. Then this equals, according to uh, Newton m m g over r squared, where the little m is the, the test mass, mass, and big M is the mass of the gravitating source, so the, the source that's causing the gravity field that the thing, the, the, the test mass is moving in, right? So then if we divide by the test mass, mass Newton's laws uh, tell us that a r equals big M G over R squared. Oh, and this is supposed to be squared up there. I forgot the square when I rewrote it up there. Okay, so then let's set those two things equal. What we then have is that this limit must equal, according to Newton's laws, G over R squared. So then the thing is, is what do we have to set S equal to in order to make that limit give the right value? It turns out S has to equal M G over C squared, which is the Schwarzschild radius, as it turns out, or half the Schwarzschild radius or something. It's related to the Schwarzschild radius. And it's the value of the constant. So then let's plug that in and see that it works. So if we plug this in, okay, 1 over 2 limit c goes to infinity c squared 2 over r squared. And then for s, m, g over c squared. Okay, so now the c squareds cancel. Uh, and then the twos cancel also. I was just thinking, where's this extra two come from? What happened? I, I was not looking at this half there. The, the twos cancel there, and then the c squareds also cancel. So then this ends up equaling the limit as c goes to infinity of simply m g over r squared, which of course, since there's no c in that anymore, is just equal to m g over r squared, which is exactly what it was supposed to. So then this is the correct value. That is the correct value for the unknown constant here. And that means we have just finished solving the Einstein field equations for the Schwarzschild metric because we have determined everything about the unknown metric functions. So I'm going to erase some stuff and then uh, plug this value of s in here and write out the full Schwarzschild metric uh, and then we will review how we got here. Okay, so I'm going to erase the 2s over r. So we've got then 2m g over uh, r c squared. Let me erase the denominator and write it nice because this is important. This is a really, really cool result. r c squared. Okay, so then this also goes to that. 2m over r c squared.
Where? Okay. Hopefully you can read that. Squared. Okay, so then this is the Schwarzschild metric. That's it. That is how you solve the Einstein field equations for the Schwarzschild metric. So let's review. We started with the Einstein field equations and the formulas for the symbols in it. We wrote out the Schwarzschild assumptions. We deduced these two facts and also the uh, Schwarzschild ansatz. We plugged the Schwarzschild ansatz and these two facts into the Einstein field equations and got that we were solving the vacuum field equations and that for the particular ansatz through the Christoffel symbols, which I have since erased, uh, give this value for the Ricci curvature tensor components that aren't identically equal to zero. And then since we're solving the vacuum field equations, we, we set them equal to zero, and that gives us the differential equations we need to actually solve. So then we play around with the first two, and we discover this fact, A equals 1 over B, so the unknown metric functions are related. We substitute that fact into the third one, which gives us this differential equation. We solve it for the functional form of the symbols, and then we take the limit of the geodesic equation, the non-relativistic limit of it, and make it agree with Newton's laws. And when we do that, that gives us the last piece of information that we need to know. That last piece of information is that the only unknown thing about the metric left is constant equals mg over c squared. So uh, then we put that in the metric, and there we go. We have the Schwarzschild metric, the final answer here. It's... It's beautiful, isn't it? Now, typically, you will have seen this written out as the line element because people like to write out the line element instead of the component form. So I'm just going to write out the line element of that uh, so that we have the, the most famous expression on the board. And I'm actually going to erase this whole lower thing so I can write it nice and big. Oof. Okay, so then the line element, the famous line element of c squared d, I'm going to write it bigger than that, make sure that it really can be seen clearly, c squared d tau squared, there we go, equals, uh, 1 minus 2mg over c squared r c squared d c squared and then minus one minus two m g over c squared r one over that d r squared Okay, and then minus r squared d theta squared minus r squared sine squared theta d phi squared. Okay, so then this deserves a box. I think my writing got smaller as I went across the board, so it's not totally even. But anyway, that's it. There you go. That is how you solve the Einstein field equations for the Schwarzschild metric. The problem of a video showing you how to do that not existing on YouTube has been solved. Dietrich out.